It's a pleasure to be invited and to speak to you about a major DARPA project, but also a company that is manufacturing modified red cells for a whole variety of therapeutic purposes. And what I'm going to tell you is a story of reality science. That is how we actually came to do it based initially on basic science in my own lab and how red cells are formed, together with DARPA's interest in making large numbers of human red cells in culture. Now, just a bit of background. I've been involved in the biotech com community for many, many years. I've helped start companies. The last one I helped start was in 2005. I work with the Mass Life Sciences Center to develop biotechnology in Massachusetts. But until 2013, that's the new company, it never really occurred to me to take research out of my laboratory and start a company. Basically, much of my professional career, actually going back to the time I was in high school, has been studying red blood cells and how the body forms them. And just to remind you, these cells occupy 40 to 50 percent of the blood volume. As Dan said, they lack a DNA. They lack a nucleus. And I'll talk more about it. They, of course, transport oxygen from the lungs to the tissues. They transport waste carbon dioxide. We produce two to three million red cells a day. But they last in the human body between 100 and 120 days. And that's the basis, as I'll describe, of using them as a vehicle for introducing large kinds of therapeutics into the body. So to just flesh out a little bit of red cell development, which is what we study, it all starts with a stem cell that makes not only red cells, but immune system cells, white blood cells, goes through a whole series of stages. And the stages that we're particularly interested in are the last stages where the progenitor cell divides and divides and divides, makes large amounts of hemoglobin, other red cell proteins. At the very end, the nucleus is lost from the cell, a very interesting process in itself. And the mature red cell, or actually an immature red cell, is released from the bone marrow. And what, of course, interests us is that this process involves many genes. There are about 400 genes that are turned on during red cell development. And my lab, for many years, has been interested in studying them. We've been very interested in hormones that regulate the process. And many of you know erythropoietin, trade name epigen or EPO or Aranesp, is a major drug because EPO controls red cell development. This progenitor cell, in the absence of EPO, dies. If it sees erythropoietin, it goes through this very characteristic process of five cell divisions and red cells. And this is really what we have been studying for many years. EPO is made in the kidney. In response to low oxygen, people with kidney failure have uh, uh, generally anemia and are treated by EPO. Now, all of our work until Dan came along was basically in the mouse system. Because mice are very easy to manipulate and work with. We can alter genes in mice very quickly. Um, Twenty-some years ago, we developed a system for making mouse red blood cells in culture, starting with progenitor cells that we isolate from embryonic or fetal livers. And what you can see are perfectly normal looking red cells. By a whole variety of criteria, they're normal. But these are made in culture from mouse progenitor cells. And we have been studying over many, many years genes that are turned on that are required to make all the components of a mature red cell. But we had never really worked on human red cells. Excuse me. So then I get this call from a DARPA contractor. We have this project of blood farming. We're trying to take stem cells from humans 
put them in culture, and make red blood cells. And the problem was, and several companies were engaged in this, they could go only so far, but the crucial last stages, making a large amount of hemoglobin, losing the nucleus, were not happening in culture. And this individual said to me, if we give you a certain amount of money, can you solve the problem? And I said, sure. And it turned out the problem was not exactly rocket science. Hemoglobin, the major protein in red cells, the red protein, uh, contains a lot of iron. And the culture's media that they were using did not have iron in the right form that could be taken up by the cells. Well, to get to the point, we developed, as you can see here, excuse me, a culture system where we could take bone marrow stem cells. So these would be the same stem cells that you would give to a patient in need of a bone marrow transplant. And we would put them in culture for three weeks. The cells would divide many, many times so that each cell would make somewhere between 50 and 70,000 daughter red cells. These red cells, by a whole variety of criteria, were normal. As you can see, they've all lost their nuclei. They have normal amounts of hemoglobin in all the red cell proteins. And then we transferred this technology to the DARPA contractors. Everyone could reproduce it, and everyone was very happy until Dan came along and said, this isn't economical. Well, before I tell you what happened next, this culture system has found enormous use in the research community. And for those who are interested, it's actually coming out tomorrow, a paper in Nature from my lab in which we use this human culture system to screen for drugs that are normally used for other indications like lowering cholesterol, but drugs that can be tr used to treat, we think, patients with anemias that cannot be treated by erythropoietin. And for a number of these bone marrow failures disorders, this could be a great advance. But that's not why I'm here to talk to you. And this is when Dan said to me about three years ago, two and a half years ago, you know, can we make high-value red cells? And I said, what do you mean by high-value red cells? And he said, I don't know. Think about it. <laughs> and what we realized is that red cells are an ideal modality for introducing therapeutics into the human body for long periods of time. And I'll tell you what some of these might be. But as Dan said, they lack a nucleus. And this is critical because we can introduce genes at will in the culture system to make proteins that we can show get incorporated into the mature red cell. But because there's no DNA, there's no risk of tumors forming or anything like that, which is a major problem in cell therapies and also in gene therapies. It's something everyone is afraid could happen. And in fact, in cases many years ago, did happen. Um, they're very well characterized. They have a large surface area. They're biconcave disks. And a lot of excellent biocompatibility. They live for many weeks, as I said, in the human body. And also, blood transfusion is widely accepted. As I say, if you tell someone they're going to get gene-modified cells, they might get very disturbed. But if you tell them you're going to get modified red cells, you know, fine. This is what we hope. So what can we do? And I'll just give you a few examples, really one example. We can put on the surface of red cells antibodies that will bind a whole variety of foreign pathogens or toxins. And ideally, and in practice, remove them from the circulation. And in principle, and we hope in practice, this can be done for several months. We can equip red cells with certain receptor proteins that will bind nasty things from the blood and hopefully remove them, such as cholesterol-rich, low-density lipoprotein, perhaps immune complexes. We can equip red cells with molecules that might target them to certain points in the vasculature, perhaps where tumors are located. Um, we 
can equip them with molecules that we think can provide sensors for monitoring various blood chemicals. And then finally, there's some evidence that molecules put on red cells do not induce an immune response, but rather induce tolerance. So basically, what we do is take advantage of the fact that red cells have only a few proteins on their surface. And these are very well characterized. One of them is the protein glycophorin, shown here. The other is the Kel protein. And these can be modified, as I'll show you in a moment. One way to do this, and this was really the first technology that we published last summer, is use a protein engineering technique developed by my colleague at Whitehead Hitta Plach, where basically one can link two proteins together if one of them has a certain sequence called LPXTG, if you can see it there, and the other one has an N-terminal glycine. It forms a covalent linkage, and it works. And it works very efficiently, and we showed this on red cells. One of the cool things that we're doing is working with single-chain camelid antibodies. And this is kind of fun, because as you know, human antibodies, mammalian antibodies in general, have two chains, a heavy and a light chain. And the engineering gets a little complicated. It turns out that camels, llamas, and particularly alpacas depicted here make only single-chain antibodies derived from the heavy chain. So it's basically a heavy chain only antibody. And we can excise, with the help of our collaborators, the business end, the antigen binding end, and fuse it to something that we're interested in. And the point is, this is working very nicely. Uh, just as an example, we've taken these single chain antibodies against botulinum toxin. Just because our collaborator, Chuck Shoemaker, at the Tufts Vet School has made these nanobodies, as we call them, link them to the red cell surface. Now, Shoemaker has shown that botulinum, that these nanobodies can protect against the appropriate botulinum toxin species. And that right now, the therapy is administration of polyclonal antisera. But as you heard, these sera last only a short time in the human body. So the whole idea would be prophylaxis against botulinum toxin, but it could be anything you could think of um, on red cells. So this simply shows one of Chuck Shoemaker's experiments where they take these nanobodies and administer them to mice and then give them a lethal dose a botulinum toxin. Without administration, the mice die very quickly. With administration, the animals survive. The problem is these nanobodies are fairly unstable, and they're cleared in, oh, generally about a day or two. So what we did is hook them to red cell surfaces, actually as a chimeric protein with either Kel or glycophorin. As a cell biologist, I like to show data. What botulinum toxin does is get into the cell and cut and inactivate an important protein in nerve cells. You can see here's the non-cleave protein and here's the cleave protein. Um, but even modest amount of red blood cells, when administered, prevent this cleavage. So this is simply a proof of principle. It's one of the experiments we've already done. But it, it tells us that in principle and in practice, we can put on the surface of red cells, as I said, alpaca nanobodies against anything we want. And Chuck has made them against many viruses. And really, the world is wide open. Uh, one could implant enzymes such as butyrylcholinesterase which is an, an antidote against nerve gases, and basically keep it functional for many months in the human body. We can, as I said, equip red cells with receptors 
that bind nasty macromolecules like cholesterol, lipoproteins, immune complexes, tumor necrosis factor, alpha, and so forth. And again, um, we can put them, uh, we can equip them in principle with sensors. We actually haven't done that. And then one could incorporate proteins into the inside of red cells. For instance, genes or proteins that might reverse certain genetic diseases. Um, molecules that might convert an inactive drug to an active drug. This is all things that we're thinking about, possibly even novel multi-enzyme complexes. So this is much of the work that is going on in my lab and several other laboratories now, supported by DARPA, to really develop as many of these examples as we can. But then, about two years ago, I was giving a talk on our early work in this area at a systems biology workshop. And afterwards, Nubar Afayan came up to me. Now, Nubar is the founder and managing partner of Flagship Ventures. I've known Nubar for a long time because I was on his thesis committee. And he said to me, you know, Harvey, I think we have a company here. And indeed, we have a company. Nubar and I and Abak, whom you'll hear from tomorrow, who's the president of the company, and several other, uh, several other partners at Flagship, spent a good part of the summer two years ago thinking through what might you actually put on or in red cells that would provide real treatment options. And I can't tell you what exactly we're doing, but it's working, and they've already put Series A funding into it. And I just want to show you two more slides. You can see the names. Um, there's Nubauer on the board, Avox on the board, I'm on the board. Some of you will notice Bob Langer, uh, Peter Hutt from the FDA. I mean, this is a serious company in which has already received Series A funding. Here, now you can see my picture. Um, we've also put together a scientific advisory board to give you an idea of the areas that we will be working in. So this whole project of surface or inside modified red cells is moving along at multiple levels, both in my lab and in our collaborators' labs, and also in the company. Now, of course, there's much more to do. Just to give you an idea, we've tested mouse red cells with these antibodies, these nanobodies. We've begun testing them, human cells expressing these nanobodies. And the first experiments are very encouraging. We need to put these human cells into mice and see that they will work in mice. Then there's another component, which is really the last line of this, my last slide, which is right now we're dealing with stem cells derived from individuals. And what we would like is to generate immortal lines of cells that can be grown in unlimited quantities in a bioreactor in an undifferentiated state, that is, with the DNA and all the genes intact, then throw a molecular switch and have these cells differentiate into normal human red cells that lose their nucleus. And two of our collaborators in the DARPA project, George Daly at Boston Children's and Tanish Daria, who's a professor at the University of California, San Diego, are working actively on this in different approaches to see if we can generate these cell lines, which will certainly facilitate many of the applications. And finally, I want to emphasize that we think this is really the tip of an iceberg, a very large iceberg. <coughs> that is, there are many types of other types of blood cells, particularly platelets, various white cells, that could be genetically modified in ways similar to what I've described putting molecules on their surface that would increase their function, putting molecules inside. And of course, many of you know that this is actually going on now with CAR T cells, taking T cells out of patients, putting in certain proteins, 
and having them enhance uh, destruction of tumor cells. So we think this whole project of hematopoietic cell engineering, not just red cell engineering, uh, has a rather bright future. And hopefully in a few years, I can come back and actually show you human diseases that we've already treated. Thank you. <laughs>